May I preach to you this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. If someone told you that you had to leave right now to go to a place that you have never been, to do a task that you have never done, what would you bring with you? What would you pack? Because I have the feeling that there's kind of a wide variety in our congregation of how some people pack. We probably have the variety of that one person that just brings their wallet, and then that other person that brings a whole camper. But what would you bring? Because the last thing that we want to do is we don't want to pack out of fear. We want to be prepared, but we don't want to be afraid and have anxiety be our motivation. When I was about seven or eight years old, we tented the house that we, excuse me, not that we bought, that my parents bought, I did not give any money to the mortgage, that my parents purchased and they said, we have to tent the house, we've got to go into a hotel for a couple of days. So all I ever heard was, we're going to a hotel. My father gave a very specific instruction. You may bring one toy. Now, as an eight-year-old, that's like saying you can only bring one child. I mean, how do you possibly choose of all the action figures and all the toys, what do you pick? Now, of course, my brother, who's seven years older, he, of course, had the solution in assisting me with this. He walks into the room and he says, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm packing for our stay at the hotel and I'm trying to pick the one toy. He says, yeah, it's a real shame what's going to happen. And I went, what, what's going to happen? He says, well, you know, the chemicals that they use to kill the bugs is corrosive to plastic. And my eyes grew as big as saucers. And so about an hour or so later, as we're getting ready to go, go into the van, I'm dragging this large contractor black bag full of toys My father says, what are you doing? And I proclaim to him, I can't let them die. I'm bringing all of them with me. Older brothers, what are we going to do? Now, in the gospel reading for today, we have Jesus telling 70 of the disciples that he has sent out, that he's going to send out, I'm sending you out to go proclaim the kingdom of heaven but there's some certain conditions that I have about you being prepared. And then he says something which I think is very interesting. He says, I'm sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. And that line really caught me because when Jesus begins to tell people what they're supposed to bring, go ahead and look carefully at your bulletin. He says, don't bring a purse. Don't bring a bag. Don't even bring sandals. And my first thought was, did he just say wolves? Because for me, I would say, no purse. How will I eat? How will I buy what I need to eat? No bag. How will I buy all that wonderful equipment that I purchase whenever I go on a trip or I go camping or an adventure? When I hear no sandals, all I hear is, don't even bring the most basic equipment with you. But Jesus does not leave them with nothing. He tells them to go out in pairs. And that, to me, in the first part of this gospel reading, which I'm going to preach about today, is the most important lesson for us. He doesn't send these people out to proclaim the kingdom by by themselves on their own. He sends them in pairs. Right? says in Scripture, two are better than one. Because if one falls, the other one picks the other one up. And we know this. How many people here have ever tried to take on a new habit, a new discipline, ever try to start working out by yourself? 
As I've said before, it starts in January. Everybody go, the gyms are full in January. By the time you get to March, it is so easy to find a machine. But if you go with someone, if somebody is holding you accountable, knocking on your door at six o'clock in the morning said, you told me to do this, we are going. You are more likely to continue in that discipline. So when Jesus sends out the pairs, he's sending them out for mutual care, for mutual strength, for mutual comfort, because he knows that it's only through teamwork that the kingdom of heaven is going to be proclaimed. Think about for a second that Jesus himself, when he goes out, he has his disciples, but in many ways, he's the first to go and proclaim. He knows what it's like to risk it, but he also knows that he's limited. He's got two hands. He's got two feet. He's got one mouth. He cannot do it all. And that is why he goes out and he sends the 70. And this is a big risk if you think about it from God's perspective, because as human beings, we don't exactly always have the best track record of following through on our disciplines, of following through on our faith, of truly being accountable. But Jesus takes that risk anyway, because he knows that the kingdom of heaven needs to be proclaimed. And so there's an important message that I want to share with us today, and it's this. If there are people in the world who don't know about the name of Jesus Christ, it's on us. If there are people in the world who are suffering, it's on us. If there are people who are hungry and thirsty, and lonely, it's on us. Because we have been sent out by Christ himself to go and proclaim the kingdom, to say as it says in the gospel today, the kingdom of heaven has come here. And remember, when we talk about the kingdom of heaven, we're talking about that place where there is not the same kind of suffering that we see in the world. It's that place that seems upside down to our secular world, but is right with God. And so this is usually the moment where somebody in the congregation might be thinking, so if I'm supposed to go out, what am I supposed to bring with me? Don't I need to be trained for this? And the answer is, of course, yes. Jesus may have sent them out with a minimal amount of equipment, but these are individuals that he trained, that had a basic knowledge of the faith that believed deeply in him before he sent them out. He didn't just cast out anybody. He sent them out prepared. And that's why as we begin to look ahead as to how our parish is going to be fulfilling our mission of proclaiming the kingdom, we've got to do a real inventory of ourselves and our activities. So for example, we have two Bible studies that take place and we have Christian formation opportunities, we have people who come forward to be baptized and confirmed. And I wanna say, I want to see more of us doing those things. If you've never attended a Bible study at our parish, I would say the fall is an excellent opportunity to start for the evening, and this Wednesday is an excellent opportunity to start for this week. If you're not sure about the faith and about maybe what we're called to believe, talk to one of the clergy. Talk to a Christian that you know maybe has been around a bit longer and say, will you go through the Book of Common Prayer with me and talk with me a little bit about some of these things? Because it's on us. When we talk about stewardship, when I first got here, one of the things that we did was we set kind of this monetary goal. But the other goal that I set, and I, don't, I know some of you may remember this, is we set a goal of participation, that 100% of our congregation would participate. And there are times when we got close to that, and I was so, so proud. Can we set that kind of goal as well for our Christian formation? 
Can we set that kind of goal for reading scripture, learning new prayer disciplines, talking with one another about our faith? Because the good news is that once we start to learn about those things, we realize that we are just eager to get up and go and start proclaiming the kingdom of heaven. But I don't want any of us to be discouraged to think that we need a degree in divinity or theology to do it. Some of the most spiritually enlightening people I've ever met, I had to learn their language first in order to have them teach me. And they were people who did not have any fancy degrees. They had the lived experience of the Spirit. If we say yes, Jesus will do the rest. If you notice it, Jesus sends them out, they say yes, and then in the latter half of the scripture, they come back, and next week is when we get the real debriefing of what they did. But if we say yes, Jesus will do the rest. In honor of the 4th of July, there's one last story that I, I want to share that I think really, to me, illustrates this. The 101st Airborne were the first individuals to, as I like to always say, jump out of perfectly good airplanes. Because to me, if the airplane is working fine, I don't understand why you jump out of it. That's me, though. But remember, before this, there had been no real training. Nobody had ever done this before in war. And so as they're up in the plane, the instructor says this. Stand at the door. Take the first step. And I guarantee you, gravity will do the rest. Stand at the door. Let us stand at the door as a congregation that says, Lord, I want to know you. I want to be fed by you so that I can take that step of proclamation of your kingdom because I know if I do, Lord, you and the Spirit of God will do the rest. Amen. Amen.